Well, as the people of God, we stand in a long line of those who have been trusting God, don't we? We're in a faith series, a short faith series at Epic Church, and today we're going to talk about how faith endures, how faith hangs in there, how it perseveres. So for me, that brought something immediately to mind, and I would say that there are three areas of my life that are fun. Number one, my life with Judy, and especially our travels and our family time. Number two, watching sports, <clears throat> football, week and a half, here we go. Number three, cycling. Guys, this is my bike, all right? Now, um, this almost feels like a personal introduction. Um, it's not the most expensive bike in the world, but it's a really good bike. It's not a Walmart bike. Two things might make bikes really good. Number one, how strong they are. Number two, how light they are. This one's made out of carbon fiber, and it weighs 16 pounds. That's pretty good. Um, this bike is made for one thing, riding a long way as fast as the engine can make it go. And the farthest I've ever ridden is 108 miles at one time. Unfortunately, it was in Colorado over two very high mountain passes. But the downhills were fun. They were scary fun. Um, in cycling, the name of the game is endurance. And that brings us back to life, doesn't it? Today we're going to talk about how faith hangs in there, how it perseveres, how it endures. And we'll get back to this bike in a minute. But um, we're going to focus on Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. So if you have a Bible uh, or a phone, uh, you might go there. If not, uh, we'll put it on the screen. And what I'd like to do is just sort of explain it in about 10 minutes, and then talk about how we can live it for another 10 minutes or so. So let's do the explanation. Hebrews 12, 1 through 3, therefore which means what he's about to say. And this, this book was written to about 20 or 30 people who formed a little church, and they were considering quitting on their faith. Now, some of you are not there, but you have been. Maybe you will be, and some of you perhaps are. So when he says, therefore, what he's doing is he's saying, based on all of these examples that you've just heard about, I need to tell you something. All these heroes of the faith mentioned in chapter 11 trusted God and they received certain promises from God, but none of them received the ultimate promise, which was Jesus. So he's saying at the very end, verses 39 and 40, together with us, all of God's people are made perfect through Jesus. So that's what the therefore means. Now, look at the next statement. Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses... I think for the longest time when I heard this, I thought, okay, I'm living my life and there are the, all these dead saints looking over the balcony of heaven watching me live, which is not a good thought, is it? Is that comforting? No, it's a little creepy, okay? Um, but I think the idea is more, instead of them looking at us, I think the idea is that we are looking to them. They are the faithful witnesses. By living the life and trusting God, they are saying, God is worth it. I am a witness to that. So we look to them. They are our examples. We look to them for the hope that we can make it too. Since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, all these great examples, all these people who have said it's worth it. Then, the next statement... Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Now, ancient runners would often strip down to run so that these long flowing robes didn't trip them and, and they didn't need the extra weight. I mean, marathons and robes just don't go together, do they? Now, notice it mentions two things. Uh, it mentions the sin that entangles us. And that's a bit obvious. We know that sin is anything that causes us to move away from God, and it definitely trips us up. But notice the other thing. Everything that hinders. There are other things, maybe not 
officially sinful. But they hinder us. They trip us up. And, and the writer says, just get rid of all this stuff. The sinful and the other stuff that hurts you. The other stuff that slows you down. Maybe it's not sinful, but it's weighing you down. Sometimes we ask the question, what's wrong with that? Well, maybe the question should be, what's right with that? Two different questions. And then the, the main command here, let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. This is the heart and soul of this. Because at some point, you just have to run. Um, you have to ride. You have to live. And what he's saying is, you have to do that with perseverance. Life is not like a sprint. It's over in 15 seconds. It is a marathon. It is an ultra marathon. And you just have to run, and you have to keep on running, and you have to keep on running, and then when you want to quit, you have to keep on running, and then when you want to quit some more, you have to keep... It, you just, it's just one big endurance race. And I think when you're a young Christian, you think, well, if, if I can be more spiritual than this person, somehow I win. And the older you get, the, the more you realize it's, we're not in competition. To persevere is to win. To endure is to win. We're running this together. Notice it's the race marked out for us. That means you don't really get to pick um, your favorite route. You don't get to pick the route that other people are running. So we can't look around and say, you know, God, why are you letting them live like this when I have to live like this? But there, there is a positive side to this. It means that God is directing all of our paths to the same finish line. He knows what we can handle. He knows where we need to go. He knows how we need to live. And then in verse 2, fixing the way we run is this. We fix our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. He's the pioneer. He's the one who started our faith. And he's the one who completes it. He's the perfecter of faith. So we get rid of the junk. We glance at our examples and our heroes, but we focus on Jesus. And then notice the rest of this is about how Jesus lived, how Jesus had faith. It says, For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And I think what's, what this says to me is that in going to the cross, Jesus, uh, he struggled with that. This wasn't just, you know, heavenly funsies or something. I mean, he, he is wrestling with, you know, the Garden of Gethsemane, sweating like drops of blood. This is, this is, a, this is agonizing. And so what he's doing, he's looking beyond... All the shame of the cross, the humiliation, the pain. He's looking beyond that to the joy of reunion with the Father. Something he enjoyed before the incarnation. He looked beyond these immediate circumstances which were shameful and painful to the ultimate reward. He cared more about the Father than he cared about his own comfort and dignity. He endured this pain and agony and humiliation. He focused on the joy to come. There's a lot in there. And then in verse 3, consider Him. Another really important command. Consider Jesus who endured all this opposition, for, opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Listen to Jesus. Think about Jesus. Reflect on Jesus. Think about how He did things. Jesus is our substitute, but He's also our example He's both. And the small group of Christians first reading this book, they were being rejected for following Jesus. People had spread rumors about them. People had rejected them. People had accused them. I mean, life was just not fun for them. They weren't, you know, they weren't just part of the in group here. They were being pushed aside, ridiculed. And the author says, Jesus faced the very same thing. You need to think about him so you don't grow weary and lose heart. You don't just give up. So, 
at the very end, before we talk about how to live this, it's so comforting to hear this writer say, we follow a Savior who knows exactly how we feel when it comes to struggling with rejection and accusation and shame. So let's talk about how to live this. There, um, this is a four-point sermon, okay? It makes it better somehow, I'm sure. Number one, we need examples. This is what all of chapter 11 was. This is why we had you guys listen to chapter 11. Um, and, it, and it raises this question, who are the people in your life who, who say to you, by their life, you can do this? You can trust God. God will never leave you. God will never forsake you. God will always be faithful. You can do this. Keep trusting. Keep running. Keep riding. Keep living. We have to have these examples. Some of us would say, well, we've got parents who are godly or grandparents or teachers. Some have coaches, perhaps church leaders, friends. We have to have these people. Because otherwise, the Christian life is just theoretical. We need to know that this can actually be lived by real flesh and blood human beings. Notice all the, the pronouns. We, us, us, our, us. The point is, this is not something, I mean, a lot of stuff in America we do as individuals. Not this. Not faith. It's, it's a corporate, it's, it's individual to be sure, but it's more than that. It's also what we do together. We can't live this life by ourselves. It is very, um, well, it's hard to raise your hand and say to people, I need people to pray for me. But then when they come around you and they pray for you, you just feel the presence of God, don't you? I mean, you, you need that. I need that. We have to have other people come alongside us and encourage us and listen to us and share life with us and say to us, I've been there. God is faithful. You can do this. So the big, one of the big questions this morning is, are we trying to do this life on our own or do we have these examples? And I think in a minute when we pray, that may be one of the things that you want to pray. God you know, I know they may be out there, but I don't know who they are, and I don't know how to get to them. Um, just cry out to God, and He will make a way for you to have these examples in your life. Number two, get rid of the junk. Um, life doesn't have to be as hard as we sometimes make it, does it? I think when you, you know, I'm, I'm not a young guy, but if I could do this all over again, I would... I would do better at life. The problem is you don't really get that chance. So you have to, you have to learn from, from people. And, and we learn from this writer that, that long flowing robes and marathons don't mix, as we said. The marathon is hard enough. Life is hard enough. Why carry unnecessary junk? When... Um, yeah, we, we know that sin entangles us, distracts us, weighs us down, trips us up. I mean, we know that sin will kill us, but maybe every once in a while someone should just say it again. Sin will kill you. It's hurting you. Um, move away from it. It's not what God wants for you. But this morning, I think maybe we need to say also, notice these other things. These, these are not sinful but they're not good. I can imagine a, a guy who is, who is ready, a military guy, a soldier who's ready for combat, you know. I mean, the whole, the whole bit, the backpack, you know, I don't know what the thing weighs, but I can imagine that if this guy weighs 200 pounds, he's got an extra 70 or 80 pounds on his person. Um... My little cycling kit, as they call it, is a pair of spandex shorts, which I didn't bring. You can thank me for that. By the way, same thing football players wear, just in case. <laughs> Question my, my manhood. Same stuff, all right? And then this, there's this little jersey 
which is pretty light. I mean, this whole thing, probably not a pound, I don't know. And then some shoes, a helmet, some glasses, some gloves. You know, I mean, you're, you're ready to go. So, you know, you're talking about 50 pounds difference. And, of course, they're doing two different things. But it, if you wouldn't want to take this guy who's prepared to fight and say, now, run a marathon, ride a century. And sometimes I think in life, that's sort of what we do. This, this may be something you just think, I can't live without this. Maybe it's a habit or a thing or a dysfunctional relationship. It's just extra junk that makes life harder than it needs to be. And right now, you're probably thinking about what that is. It's wasteful. It might be the very thing robbing you of energy and time and joy and maybe even money. Maybe it's the thing that's just keeping you from growing up. And you know God is just constantly whispering to you, just let that go. What you think is making your life better might actually be hindering your walk with God and your relationships with other people. And maybe, as, as we're told this morning, it's just time to get rid of that. I don't think there's ever going to be a time in this fallen world where when you can just say yes to whatever comes along, you're going to have to say no to some things. It, it, it would be nice to say this is just a positive thinking sort of faith where you just say yes to no. I think you've got to say, I'm, you've got to tell yourself no. I mean, there's a little kid in us that just never goes away. And you just have to say, you can't do that, Duval. No. You know, you just talk to yourself like you're the parent. Some psychologists out there are probably writing me up right now for that. Um, but I think we have to say no to some things to say yes to God's best for our lives. We really do. And the author says, get rid of the sinful stuff, but get rid of anything else that entangles you. Number three, there's no sub for this one. You, you just have to keep on doing life. Uh, mentioned that that long bike ride in Colorado um, when when you ride that far um, you have to ride almost that far in preparation for the ride and I had trained and I had prepared and you know I had some examples guys who had been doing this a long time and uh, you know I got rid of the junk uh, I didn't wear my Sunday suit you know to ride the century and it came time to ride, and you actually had to ride. And there's just no, no sub for that. And the first, you know, you're so full of carbs and adrenaline that the first 30, 40 miles are pretty easy. I mean, it's fun. Um, on this ride, we just began climbing right away. And, uh, but I was still full of, full of energy. And about the first 50 miles are actually pretty easy. But then it, it was August, and in Colorado, it gets hot in August, and it got hot, and it was windy, and we hit the second big climb. And usually around mile 60 or 70, you just, thanks for that, you just, um, you start to get tired. And it's about like mile 18 on a marathon, about the equivalent of that. Your body just starts to hurt. And then it becomes kind of mental as well as physical. And you've got wind and heat. And, you know, wh what I found works for me is to think, just ride to that corner. <laughs> just ride to that rest stop. Just, you, just, you just set very short term. Don't think about how life's going to go for the next year or the next month or the next week. Or even just, just live this hour. Sometimes that's what you have to do if you're going to endure. Um, and I wanted to quit. I got to mile 85 and I just sat down under a tree. It was like, you know, one of those Old Testament characters. Just, I'm done. Lord, I give up. There's nothing spiritual about it. I just thought, this is just stupid. Why do you do this? You know? So I sat down there for a while and then I just kind of, you know, I was in the shade. I just started feeling better and got back on the bike and finished. This is the main command. Let us run with perseverance. So no matter how difficult life gets, you know, you still have to go on living. 
Um, and you just, this is going to mean you have to put forth effort and you have to make decisions and you have to relate to people and you have to make plans and you, you know, I'm, I mean, you just, that's part of it. And everybody's race is a little different. Some long bike rides are really flat. I'm going to do one in Texas in a few weeks, and it's just flat and easy compared to this Little Rock thing that's coming up, right? Some routes have a lot of climbing. Some routes are hot. Some are cool. God has given us a different course. So comparison, you guys, is deadly. We just don't even go there. Um, we don't know why. And also, not everyone's life is really what it looks like on the outside, is it? Sometimes they're dealing with stuff we just don't know about. It's not that God causes everything that happens in life. He doesn't cause me to sin. We have spiritual enemies. People make bad decisions. People sin against other people. And all of this can kind of alter your course temporarily. But I love Romans 8.28 because what it promises is that God is at work through all of these little course changes to work out his larger purposes in your life. You can trust him to do that. And often God calls us to partner with him in bringing good out of a very bad situation. So whatever your course, um, what God's calling you to do this morning is just continue writing. Just one pedal stroke, one foot, just keep doing that. And we're going to pray that God would send you a fresh wave of his grace and mercy and strength. Stay on the bike. If you do get off, cool off a bit, sit down, take a break, but get back on. And don't give up and don't stop. To persevere is to win. And then I love the fourth one. We need a focus that is sustaining. And there's only one, and it's the Lord himself. He endured the pain of the cross, ignored the shame of the cross for the joy of reunion with the Father. That's why he did this. He believed, I think, deep in his soul that, that walking with God and doing things the Father's way ultimately leads to eternal joy. Now, we've got a lot of options for focal points. And a lot of them are very good. But my experience has been that none of them, not your spouse, not your family, not your church, none of them will 100% sustain you all of the time. Now, God uses them as a part of His sustaining strength, but the only one that will never, ever, ever, ever let you down is the Lord. And that's what we're called to make our focal point. I think this might be a good day for some of us to return to focusing on Jesus. This doesn't mean you just stare at a picture of Jesus, obviously. It means that you, you, you think about how your life is oriented around a relationship, a person. We're not just doing this because we're supposed to. We, we are worshiping the living, resurrected Lord. We get to know him, we listen to him, we follow his spirit, he gives us strength, we walk with him. He's our focus. Just like for Jesus, the Father was his focus. So I want us to pray now and pray through each of these and uh, just trust that God's spirit would work. So just bow your heads with me and let me lead us in a prayer as we seek to, um, to let God's word really reach deep into our, our minds and our hearts. God... Open our eyes to, to examples, to people who have walked this road ahead of us that, that could offer encouragement. Help us to be aware, become aware of these, of these faithful witnesses that are, that are touching our lives in some way. Remind us, Lord, that we cannot run alone. It's just too difficult. And show us how we can come to depend on our community. Um, how we, 
we need these heroes. Show us who they are, Lord. Lead us to them. Uh, make a way for us to, to somehow be in and around their lives and, and be encouraged by, by their confession that you are faithful. God, we pray that you'd help us to get rid of the junk. Show us what's weighing us down, what is making life much harder than it has to be. Maybe it's our own pride. Maybe it's a habit. Perhaps, Lord, it's a relationship. Um, maybe it's a, a, a thing, like a phone. Who knows, God? But just show us what we need to let go of so that we can follow you more faithfully so that we can experience life more, more fully. God, help us to keep running. Give us the strength to live the next week, the next day, even just the next minute. Give us the grace, Lord, and the power for this next step. And remind us that when we persevere, we win. So we turn to you for that strength. And Lord, help us to focus on you. It's very tempting, God, in, in life to look, look down the road, to focus on the future and the plans and the circumstances. But help us to look to you. Help us to make this personal. It's, it's easy to focus on other people or my own situation instead of you, Lord. But we want to refocus on you. It's, it's not our gifts and abilities and, and all that we're doing for you even. Lord, just strip away everything and help us to focus on you. Because you alone are able to give us life. All of these other really good things come alongside our relationship with you and make it rich and deep and full, but you alone are our God. Continue to work in our lives, Lord, we pray.